Hi, who do you think could beat who in a fight out of all of your original characters? Who do you think would come out on top? Toon's got it. I mean, you, you got to root for the home team, right? I think Toon could take you all. Do we I get think to Thread would disassemble Toon's. Six of our main characters as one team. The main we might character have a shot. Is a one team, team of red shirts yeah. for Thread to also yeah. murder. Oh. Yeah. A, a <laughs> red shirt. If we get the big robotic. I was going to say that's part of the team too. And then there's another character who's quite a good shot and is very far away. So yeah. I think. I yeah. think the Infinite Universe team wins, and I think that's just the end of the discussion. <laughs> and, that's and you're not biased that. at all. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because like Thread can only have only be in one place at one time, right? And there's like five of them. Yeah, you saw her take down that all those Valkyries, the lightning bolt, though. Just big old thunderstorm done. Yeah, but like our. Then I can move on to disassembling two. Oh wait, wait. if we get the swim, though, that question. If we get the the team, then does. Does Thread get the pig? Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, I think that, yeah, I think that's only fair. If you makes, guys get to assemble makes, a whole team, Thread does as well. She gets well, maybe, the ride. But we get our mothership then. <laughs> yeah, we get the ship. Yeah. Ooh, are we including vehicles in this? Because are vehicles part of the team? And is a flying golden boar a vehicle? I mean, the vehicle is on the cover. That's well, we also we also oh, have a terraformer true. in our book too, so we got yeah, a terraformer at the bottom of the ocean. Allowed, then machines Wait. are allowed. <laughs> yeah, has this discussion become like our sent our vehicle sentient? Because I'm sure there's a lot of examples in genre that we could bring up. Well, ours are, so we've won that round. Ah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One of I ours is only sentient. Once sentient is a person. Being, I feel like maybe that's the defining line: is whether or not it's sentient. Does it I feel have like to that's say like a that fair, hard it? line, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if all sentient beings are allowed, including vehicles and robots, then who wins? In my experience, all sentient beings are weak to being hit by a hammer and lightning. So no way, Mark can throw it. All wear metal suits. <laughs> they can definitely withstand the hammer. No. I haven't. We haven't revealed in the book, but all of our characters have the ability to turn into giant celestial beings with unending and unrelenting. <laughs> so, and they're impervious yeah. to hammers. Oh, yeah. Shoot. Oh, well, then, yeah. You get Infinite a universe cast by a mile. Out. Shoot, I'm out. Yeah. It actually turns out everyone's naturally grounded to electricity. Their feet are made of rubber, so it works out really well. <laughs> what do you think, Justin? Our character swims in lava without missing a beat. I think they could take any of these. That's pretty good. Also powered by electricity. So it'd be that scene from um, the first Avengers with Iron Man and Thor. He just power it up. Probably. Well, somebody in chat is saying Cassie would clearly win in this. Cassie's not even in this one. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I'll give, you that. I'll give you that. She's there in spirit, I think. She's there in spirit. Well, welcome here, everybody. Uh, I'm I'm excited uh, for tonight. So you want to make a graphic novel? We've got five creators here with their work that we're super excited to share with you. Before we get there, I do have a few announcements that I kind of want to go through. First off, my name is Kyle Rudge. I'm the business and marketing director of Mythos and Inc. We are an independent press out of Winnipeg, Manitoba, and our motto is to publish stories for geeks by geeks. Uh, I'm very excited to introduce my cohort and host for this evening, Christiana Jones. Christiana is the publicist and newest addition to the Mythos and Inc. team. So what better way to introduce them by making them host a live event? No pressure, Christiana. No pressure. Well, that's some poise. <laughs> no panic, nothing. I love it. Few announcements. The three graphic novels you're going to see to the right are Infinite Universe, Thrud, and Rust and Water. There are, they are available or will be available for order or pre-order at mythosinc.com. You can check links in the description below for all that information. Secondly, we do have a giveaway for tonight and for everyone in attendance. Well, we're not going to give away to everyone in attendance. That doesn't make sense. We have a giveaway for one person that we're going to give away from the people that are in attendance. That's better. 
Uh, Emma Scrumita, she's our assistant editor, and she's managing the chat tonight on all the platforms. So that's YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and she's also the one running the contest. So throughout the throughout the night, if you have questions for any of our creators, feel free to toss that up in the chat, wherever you may be, and Emma will filter that in, and she's going to create a big list, and then at the end of the night, we're going to give away uh, one of each of these books uh, to one lucky winner. We're super excited about that. I'll be back at the end of the event to announce the winner of the contest and wrap it up. So, Christiana, I turn it over to you and our five incredible comic creators. Hi. Uh, no pressure at all with this being my first event. I love it. We thrive under pressure. Um, like Kyle mentioned, my name is Christiana Jones. I am the public relations director for Mythos and Inc. My pronouns are they, them. I will be interviewing these wonderful creators and talking about their novels a bit. So without any particular order, we're going to jump right into that. Um, Lyndon and Steve, the creators of Infinite Universe, can you tell us a little bit about your graphic novel? Well, I'm Steven. Uh, I don't know where Lyndon is, but that's Lyndon. Um, we wrote this you. book. I'm above you. You're above me. Uh, Infinite Universe is uh, it's a story about the science fiction action adventure story that really strikes at what it means to be human and we bring it out into space where kind of all bets are off and we get to really exercise what a human would do in a very inhuman situation. Yeah, hi, my name is uh, Linda Verchenka, uh, writer, comic letterer, kind of a lawyer, it's a totally different story. Uh, my, we're here with Infinite Universe, um, as Stephen said, science fiction, action adventure. Uh, it's about a team of humans who are searching for a new planet to colonize uh, because they believe that Earth will no longer support human life. Lyndon, didn't you just uh, win an award as well? Can you tell us a tiny bit about that? <laughs> uh, yeah, I won an award for favorite letterer in the Sequential Magazine Awards this year. Um, there's not much else for me to say about it except that uh i couldn't have done it with probably everyone who knows me that's watching this stream right now voting for me so thank you all very much i get this nice plaque beside me wonderful okay thank you guys um zach do you want to talk a little bit about thread uh definitely yeah uh thread is a series of short comics i made about a girl named thread in a post ragnarok norse world that's their apocalypse if you're been living under a rock and haven't seen a Marvel movie. Um, oh, you're here. <laughs> her uh, companion is Kwasir, a little puddle of God spit she's carrying around. And uh, they explore a world filled with ghosts and giants and gods and find magic relics and try to save the realm, or at least what's left of it. And uh, it's a combination of a bunch of little short stories that all kind of build towards the thing and told out of, out of order. And it's a lot of fun. So does it follow the the traditional Norse story of Ragnarok or does it kind of diverge into its own story? It definitely kind of, Ragnarok already happened a while before the story takes place. And so they're kind of, Kvasir is familiar with the events, how they're supposed to play out in Norse mythology. And they're trying to piece together what happened and what went wrong and uh, why people are still existing in this world after the world is supposed to have ended. And they're trying to figure all that out kind of as they go on their little journey. So we kind of blow past traditional Ragnarok and I just took little bits of inspiration from old legends, but it's definitely a new kind of twist on these old stories. Awesome. Uh, Justin and Gregory, do you want to talk about rust and water? Sure, why don't I talk just briefly about the themes and I'll let Justin tell you about all the, like all the interesting stuff that's in the book, <laughs> right? So Jim, speaking very generally, it's a story about when two cultures don't have a common language how they find music as a way to communicate together. Um, but all the real good stuff happens on the page and that was Justin's job. So I'll let him talk about that. <laughs> See, and all I wanted to do was draw mermaids and robots at the bottom of the ocean and explore a really cool alien ocean floor world. And then Gregory came along and strung it together into a coherent story. But really I just wanted to draw robots and mermaids and we ended up with a book you hate it when that happens? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's worst. fair. Don't we all just want to sit around and draw robots and mermaids all day? Like, that would 
make life perfect. Um, so did you find it? Uh, how did you guys like come together for that story? Just a little bit on that. Uh, we had worked together on a, uh, a previous story um, called Cassie and Tong, which is actually set in the same universe, but completely different story. And uh, we worked really well together. Um, usually the, we would story break together and then I would go away and start making pages and artwork. And slowly Greg would kind of come in with the writing, but the bulk of the writing was kind of happening at the end after the story was told visually. So it was, um, yeah, it was just a really good working relationship and it worked really well the first time. So we came together to do it again and we're moving Thanks. on to book five together, I think at this point. So it's still working. Yeah, that's first, awesome. The first one we did together, we bounced back and forth, uh, you know, remotely. Uh, and then once we started sharing a studio together, it was a lot easier to collaborate in that way. It sounds kind of like, how could you pull off a story that way? But uh, we were doing it kind of a page at a time, just bouncing ideas back and forth and then putting it together. So nice. So um, now that we kind of have an idea of everyone's stories and the universes that they exist in, um, I, we just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the fact that this is what uh, some people would call a panel, which is like an all white panel. We acknowledge that this isn't necessarily the most diverse group of people, at least when it comes to race. And um, we just kind of wanted to acknowledge that and it would be kind of ignorant to make this thing happen and not acknowledge that this is a thing, right? Um, so we just kind of wanted to talk about, about the fact that it, it is really difficult for BIPOC people to be published and to break into this industry. And um, yeah, we just wanted to like make sure that we're aware of that. So um, we also just want to say that Mythos and Inc. is kind of putting a priority on BIPOC individuals and their stories. And we want to make sure that they're published and uh, LGBTQ plus stories and that kind of stuff. We want to really make sure that um, these marginalized communities have a voice and uh, maybe it's not super visually apparent at right this second, um, but it is something that we prioritize. So I just wanted to take a second to point that out. Um, so now I wanna move into like a round table discussion kind of about the graphic novel creation process, because I know each one of you had a different process as to how to create the graphic novel, your motivations for it, that kind of thing. Um, so I'm gonna just move in the same order that I did with asking you about your creations. And uh, Lyndon and Steve, what was your creation for the graphic novels and how did you come up with this idea? And what was the process from basically idea to fruition from coming up with the story to making it actually happen like this tangible thing you want me to go first i, I can go first yeah you go first um man i've never told this story before um so i'm gonna be it was our first book lie you give me a fact checker this okay <laughs> there's other places to reference yeah okay uh I, wow, it was wild. It, it was it was recent. Um, I'm having trouble thinking of where we started here. Steve and I went Thank to you. San Diego Comic Con together. And <laughs> oh, we how saw was that? well, amazing. But we saw you know, um, countless number of indie made comics. And Stephen and I would say we should make a comic because we oh yeah together. we said that for a while yeah we did that for a long time so we we worked together uh at the keg at the same time once upon a time and we went to san diego comic-con together and we said you know we should make a comic and then we came home and we didn't do anything mm -hmm. yeah it took a while uh we talked about it a lot uh, we went to the comic shop a lot um uh, and then i think one day how much long after probably a year after at least a year. Yeah. Uh, we were on our way to the comic shop. And I think I said, like, dude, I've got an idea for a book. And then we just, by the time that trip to the shop and back was done, we already had, like, our main story beats laid out for the book. Yeah. And at the end, we were like, I guess we're doing this. And, yeah. It ran, it ran uh, away from us. Yeah. Oh, and then another thing I did. Um, before that point that got me really thinking about like making comics was I took a, a course by oh, yeah, a couple of local legends. Yeah, I took, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, dude, we can, I could do this. I yeah. could do this. If, if they could I, do it, you could do it. <laughs> I don't remember the teacher's names, but man, legendary. Um, and do you remember no, the organization by chance? Like what, yeah, where did you take this course through? 
Yeah, it was I, I uh, an I'm organization. Perpetuating an inside joke here. Um, no, it, <laughs> the gentleman laughing, and uh, uh, so Gregory Kamichuk and uh, Justin Curry actually ran this course uh, on <laughs> yeah, how to make perfect. a comic, and it was like uh, I learned. I, I often say is I learned more about making art um, in those three weeks because I think it was like an hour every night for three weeks or an hour every Tuesday for three weeks or whatever than I did in my entire five-year university degree. <laughs> um, so I was very happy about it. He waves it off, but it's true. Um, yeah, and then after we we got those story beats down, uh, after that, I think we just 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 by the seat of our pants just kept going until mm -hmm. until it was made and to, and yeah i think there's a big point though that we learned uh i definitely learned you need to when you're making a graphic novel you need to make sure you have a deadline that that helped as well yeah yeah cool Lyndon, what do you have to add to that I think he's frozen. Are you frozen, uh -huh. Lyndon? You're frozen in at least a very nice pose. You look yeah. real. Yeah. I thought he was it's holding that pose. Actually. Yeah. Yeah. It does look like it's on purpose. Oh, he just oh, blink. Blink. When mine freezes. Is he doing he a bit? I saw him blink. Is he doing <laughs> <a> <laughs> just moved. Lyndon. It's a good bit. Oh, no, Lyndon. we're slowly getting the feed. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's amazing. I'm gonna so Lyndon would add, well, he's well, never well. had a better creative experience <laughs> with any artist <laughs> at, uh, at, at all without, uh, other than with me. I just uh, <laughs> think we lost Meanwhile, Lyndon but, entirely. Um, yeah. oh, so maybe you can answer on behalf of Lyndon. Sure, um, I'll try. What did you do first in this process? So you came up with the story did you write it first? Did you draw it first? Did you do a storyboard? Like kind of what was that step-by-step -step process for creating it? We, uh, we tried to do it as traditionally as possible. Um, Lyndon started working on a script based on the points we had laid out, like that we actually went to a bar, wrote it on a napkin, actually it was on a little server notepad. Um, and he took those and started writing a script out of it. And it, in the meantime, I conceptualize as much as possible. Um, uh, I just tried to draw all my characters, design their costumes. I knew I wanted to go with a look that was um, uh, like, how could this be a spacesuit? Like in, like, I don't know, Star Trek or something like that, where it's just all like shiny tights, stuff like that. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then by the time, and then Lyndon got that script together and then just started working from the script. Uh, in the beginning, I was probably doing a page a week-ish, thinking I was yeah. moving fast. Um, but then, but, oh, Lennon's back, good. By the time we got closer to the deadline, um, I was doing something, I think I did. Think I did the last 22 pages in the last two weeks, which I was pretty proud of at that time. Um, and some of the best pages in the book are in that block, which is pretty cool. Um, I don't know, uh, Lyndon. Yeah, hi. Anything to add? You're back. Um, one of the most important things that, the most important steps that happened at my end when uh, writing the story for this book was you and I started off with a very, very large story that we wanted to tell. And I yeah. spoke to a, um, a, a mentor of mine at the time who happened to tell me that my story was too large and that if I wanted to finish something, I needed to cut it down. Um, to a manageable length. And uh, that person's name was Gregory Kamichuk. <laughs> it's all connected. Right? It's yeah. all interconnected. Yeah. So, I mean, I think. Oh, no, keep going. I, I was just going to say, I keep think going, keep going. serves as a reminder to everyone who is uh, creating any type of project that there are people who have done those before and that it's a valuable, that they're a valuable resource in aiding you along the way and that the advice they give you is you know some of the most important advice you're going to get from anyone and i would say have oh, screwed up a lot if you find yeah, but you screwed you up, screwed up lot, so that we don't screw up that's, that's right. the point and yeah. you can pass like how i screwed up advice down that's it's like, like a shortcut yeah, yeah. Right. another factor that we leaned on a lot when we were making the book 
um, or really designing the story and stuff was the idea that your first book is just not your magnum opus. We chose like a very broad subject, which is people in a spaceship. Um, very like not a lot of like detail in the lore and stuff like that. We just wanted to tell a story with More a skin on it. What? Lore is yeah. over. Lore comes later in the fan fiction and stuff. Uh, which there is a thriving community for fan fiction for our book. For Infinite Universe, yeah. Thank you. Is thank there, you to our fans. Is there fans. Thank you. Is it's, there all, it's all erotic. <laughs> Thanks to Mythos and Ink, there will be soon. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. I'll start it as a fan fiction fan, as a fan fan fiction. I will get that going for you. Perfect. But I think that discussion actually brings up a very good point in that um, people who are new to creating something should really reach out to people in their community. Right? Like, I think that's one of the things that I'm getting from your story is that oh, yeah. it really was a community effort and reaching out and having those conversations with people and not being afraid to start that conversation, I think is a very important thing that people who are watching this and who maybe want to start a graphic novel could take away from this, right? Is that yeah. don't be afraid to reach out and don't be afraid to send that message or send that email and even just ask because you'll, you'll never know what comes from it, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Do you guys feel like you, you covered your process well? I'd say so. I, I mean, I would love to, 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 to plus one on, on Chris's statement there. Um, like, you're going to find your community in a bunch of different places. And I know right now we don't have um, conventions and stuff. But honestly, that was yeah. that truly helped us. I know that helped me as an artist in the beginning before Lyndon and I linked up on this. Um, if you have something you want to show people, a comic, even like your local comic convention is like such a good place for that. Like, yeah, you know, a little money up front to get the table, but but honestly, like it's totally worth it. You know, like you'll be nervous to no end, but you'll meet so many crazy people, crazy awesome people who just want to hear about what you're working on and, and are ready to listen. And, and that's just, that's how you build that community. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. And even just attending it, like you don't necessarily yeah. have to buy a table, but if you're, if you're interested in this, attend those local conventions and talk mm -hmm. to those artists and have those conversations and don't be afraid to reach out. I think that's like, that is a big takeaway from this, right? Where it's in so many industries, especially in creative industries, not being afraid to reach out to people and have those conversations is such an important thing right and building that community is very very vital okay do you guys feel good are we ready to move on Please. sure <laughs> <laughs> Lyndon's like don't put the spotlight on me but I'm like anyways um Zach do you want to talk a bit about your process of thread and how again how it kind of you came up with the idea how you started it how you moved on with it and how it kind of came to fruition are you really like Definitely. Tell us that story, start All to right. finish. Yeah. So I was talking with my friend and mentor, Greg Kamichuk. No, <laughs> Is that how That's all of you are going to start? I, <laughs> no. That's a lot. I barely knew him then. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, for Thread, I actually, it's a really gross artsy fartsy story. I came up with Thread one night during a thunderstorm and uh, I was in bed thinking up ideas and I had just read uh, Neil Gaiman's Norse Mythology. And at the end of his foreword, I, let me pull up the quote. I want to read it because it is what yeah. made me your thread. He says at the end of his introduction, that's the joy of myths. The fun comes in telling them yourself, something I warmly encourage you to do, you person reading this. Read the stories in this book and make them your own. And on some dark and icy winter's evening or on a summer night when the sun will not set, tell your friends what happened when Thor's hammer was stolen or how Odin obtained the meat of poetry for the gods. And I, that's, that was kicking around my head for the week since I had read that and then there was a thunderstorm at night and I was like I had also just read early Dragon Ball stuff where it's clear that Akira Toriyama was just making stuff up by the seat of his pants yeah <laughs> oh good <laughs> and was that just, the Dragon Ball manga that you were reading the very first I bought the first the three in one volume just as like I'll try it out see this art I've okay. never been a huge manga guy but I tried it out and I loved how like whimsical and fun yeah. and exploration based it was just he clearly wrote himself into a corner and went, I will deal with that later. Yeah. And I went, I should do that. And so I did that with Thread. And um, that night I was writing on my phone, taking notes and like, okay, hey, this isn't going to cut it. And I got out of bed and actually just stayed up all night sketching and writing and came up with the whole 
a fair bit of it. Stuff that worked into the comic like months later was all done that night, which is kind of cool. Um, but the, the process I told Thread in was this non-sequential kind of bite-sized little short comics. And they were, uh, I'd write myself into a corner and be like, I don't know how to deal with that. And then I just tell a different story and <laughs> figure it out later. Uh, and the big important thing, the reason I got the book done, especially in a year that had a lot of stress towards the back half, um, I just, I put the, I've made a short story and I put it up online. Um, and I didn't go back and edit it and nitpick it. And I'm not sure if this will be my project or my process for every project forever, but it was really, really good for me to just make a thing, post it, not go back and nitpick myself to death. Cause that's, you'll never get something done. Um, so yeah. if you're trying to overcome being a perfectionist or if you're trying to just make yourself finish a thing that you have been out, unable to, if you post it in bite-sized chunks, like I think that's maybe why web comic artists are able to put out so much content. I tried to do as a web comic and had just no traction there. But as a way of getting myself to make a thing, that's an interesting format that I would definitely recommend if you feel like you're stuck in a project. It really helped me. Um, so yeah, bite-sized little chunks, break it down and, and now I've got a whole book. I think you have a fantastic point there in that 90% um, of writing or creative production is just sitting down and doing the thing. You know what I mean? Like you just have to, you gotta sit down and you gotta do it. Even if you're not always in the mood, you gotta sit down, you gotta do the thing. Um, so once you had all of these bite-sized pieces, how did you put it together into like an anthology or into one cohesive story? What's the process from there? I didn't actually, in the nature of me not letting myself edit it, I just, I put them in the order I told them in. I didn't let myself do anything else. I just, as I made them up. So as a result, I think I could have worked another fight or two into the beginning and kept the action up a little bit. Like there's a couple things I would change if I was letting myself do that, but I specifically wasn't. And that's why I got the book done. So I, I'm, I stand by what I made. Uh, but little edits might have been, I don't know, depends on the project, but sometimes there's a line of, of editing, but if it's getting in the way of you putting a book out, I'd say go for what I did and just crap it out. <laughs> don't worry about it. Honestly, that's sometimes the process, right? Where you, like I said, you, you, you just got to do the thing and sometimes that's it. You just have to, you have to write it and you have to put it out there. So what, um, kind of moving on from that, what brought you to Mythos and Inc. and to the publishing process for a minute? Um, I had put it out, like I said, as a web comic um, on Webtoons, and it's now down on there. But I, I was trying to put it out and build a following and go that way. And I realized I work in a comic shop as my side gig. And I realized that's kind of more what I'm looking to make is a tangible thing I can put into people's hands. And I approached Mythos with it pretty early on, and they liked the idea of it. And it just it didn't quite work out in the first bit. So I went and kickstarted it myself. And then I came back to them and we were doing this release now and putting it out to get it out there further. But I, I did yeah. a little kickstart run to get it into the first couple people's hands. And that was a lot of fun to work that close with the fans and build up a bit of a following and stuff. So I went and did it yeah. Yeah, with the Kickstarter thing, which is a really cool platform for people like us, I think helps us get our books into people's hands. Yeah, Kickstarter is definitely something that, um, like I have personal experience, like Kickstarter a convention kind of thing. Like there, there, there's lots of uses for Kickstarter and, um, I think that's like a good example, again, of falling back onto community and knowing that there's a community behind you. Um, with you saying that you were trying to like make it happen as a web thing, I think that's another interesting thing to bring up because there's there are so many competing things happening online. Yeah. And uh, it is sometimes hard to bring yourself to the forefront and find your niche and that, that kind of thing. So I think obviously Mythos and Inc is so happy to have you and we're so happy it worked out. Yeah, um, me too. And sometimes that's like the thing that you need, right? Where it's, you could try to make a web comic work out of all of these other web, web comics that are already working. And then having that publishing and, or that Kickstarter or like finding a new angle is sometimes what you need. Yeah. And I think that's, that's a very interesting approach to creation for sure. And I also love yeah. the, the sequential kind of, um, what you mentioned with, um, saying that when you didn't want to write a scene you just didn't write it you just moved on to the next scene that is the thing that I suggest everyone does like I do I like I write professionally in my day job much more boring stuff but that is always the suggestion I give people if you don't feel like writing that paragraph or writing that thing move on to the next thing and you can always come back to it and you can always make, fill it out that kind of stuff so doing what you're enthusiastic about kind of fills that void of where you have to create at the end of the day, if you want to make the thing, you have to make the thing, but sometimes taking those steps to 
make what you're excited about is a very, very important thing. Definitely. So it was kind of weird because I was posting it as I was. Uh, yeah, as I was, I was Sorry? posting it as I moved on. So that was kind of a weird twist on that process, I think, because normally you'd go yeah. back and finish it later. For me, I was just like, well, it's out there. I can't. I, towards the you end, can't I can't stop the, now, right? The There's almost an accountability in that when you share it. Yeah. Right? Where it's like, you're, I'm starting this thing and I need to continue yeah. this thing. Otherwise, I have to admit that I'm not continuing this thing very publicly. Right? Well, I hit a point towards the three quarters point of the book when I had put out about two thirds, three quarters of the stories and went, okay, I have to figure out an ending because I don't have one and we're about to end. Yeah. So I went for like a four hour walk and just kind of tried to piece the pieces together. And then I told the last couple stories. So that was a bit more planning than I had done up till that point. But I'm glad I did because it did give it a nice cohesive ending that brought up, I was leaving myself open plot hooks so that there was stuff to wrap up. But uh, yeah. at that point, I had no idea how I was going to end it. And I'm like, I need something. So yeah. Um, you do have to end it at some point. You, you do have to have an ending in yeah. mind at some point. But for me, it came along pretty late and it all kind of worked organically, but you have to know how you're going to end yeah. the thing. Yeah, I, th I feel like you are the perfect example to put between Lyndon and, and Stephen, where it's like Lyndon and Stephen had it pretty thoroughly thought out. They had a script, they had a lot of stuff. Yeah. Whereas you approached it from, I'm going to tell the stories that I feel like telling in little tidbits, little bite-sized pieces kind of thing. Yeah. Whereas they started, you know, the, the typical plot arc kind of thing. And yeah. I think those are two very interesting things to contrast because they're both fantastic stories and they're both awesome to read, but they're two very different approaches. And I, yeah. I, I like that. That's one of the great things about being creative, right? I'm working on a volume two that is more towards, like I'm planning it all out and telling one longer format story for the most part. There'll be some jumping up mostly. So I'm going to try that again. I just, it's always interesting to try new processes and try to make something that you enjoy making. And yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's it, right? Like you have to enjoy making it at least to some extent. Yeah. When I and said you have to do the work, you got to do the work, but you don't, I think it's very important that you're enthusiastic about that story, right? Yeah, I really was. And I hope that shows in thread. Yeah, oh, it absolutely does. No questions. Um, okay, so are you, do you feel like we're good? We can move on? Definitely. Okay. I always just like to double check. Um, so then we're moving on to Justin and Gregory with their process for rust and water. So what did the process of that look like? Yes, we heard from Lyndon and Steven and Zach that you guys are, Zach was being cheeky about it, but you guys are pretty, pretty uh, influential in the community. And what was, what did your process look like? And, and what, what brought you from the idea to the finished product? We're kind of wow us with your creative process. Yeah, I don't know about that. <laughs> We're kind of the reverse. Whereas Lyndon started with the script and then Steven came in and added the visuals. Justin and I tend to work the reverse of that. We come up with the visual story first and then add the narrative later. So why don't Justin, you tell them about how we got from Catskin to, to making uh, robots at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, and I'll uh, come in later about how the narrative fit in. Yeah, so with our first book, Cassie and Tonk, we had a, a blank page at the beginning of the story. And our distribution method was Comic Cons and book touring and school visits. So we were in person for 99% of our sales. And what we would do is we would sketch on that first page of the book. So we wouldn't only sign, like not just sign it, we'd also do a little uh, personalized sketch. Um, and, and we stopped asking what people wanted early on because some people had some pretty elaborate requests. Um, not that good at drawing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we usually, um, we, we would ask like, do you want robots or monsters? And, um, every so often we would, um, we started seeing the same characters over and over again. When we had to draw, you know, a robot over and over again, we try to make it different, but we, we started to see some of our favorite characters kept showing up. And this one character that I really liked drawing was a one-armed robot at the bottom of the ocean. And then I'd hand the book over to Gregory and he'd usually do some big Leviathan or scary sea creature. Um, usually not in a scary fashion, but like going up curious to, to see what the robot was up to. So we just kept drawing that kind of relationship of this robot and this and sea monsters and then mermaids at the bottom of the ocean, which then just kind of led into us um, story breaking and, and pitching on like what the what the story was before that point and what could happen after 
And that turned into um, me storyboarding and then going to Gregory with a full storyboard and he kind of broke it apart. We kind of went back and forth, probably two or three different versions. Um, all, the, all the while, while we were on the road selling Cassie and Tonk and, and our other artwork. So it was kind of um, like done in, in bits and pieces. And then finally, we, we had a storyboard that we were pretty happy with, but um, I know from experience of making a couple books that things really don't come together um, until you start making the actual artwork. You can, you, you can plan as much as you want, but the best product is gonna come if you have a bit of freedom while you're making it. And so that's what we tried to leave in with, um, with all our books is this um, ability and room to evolve as, as the final book is being made. And I think um, with Rust and Water, especially the ending, we really didn't have it figured out until 80% of the book was finished and we had a looming print deadline coming up. Um, so I'm gonna echo um, like Steven and, and Lyndon and, and Zach with that, having some kind of finish line. And for, for us, it was, we had set a print deadline months in the future and we couldn't miss that. And that's, I think that's how I get books done is I have that print deadline is super important to have because if I didn't have that, I don't know if I'd ever finish a book. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I can echo that. I think an interesting part of the process of Rust and Water is that um, the development sketches that went into making the book are spread across a couple of hundred copies of Cassie and Tom. We don't have those anymore. We would just do a different version and he would set up the drawing and I would knock it down and he'd go, oh, I like that one. And then the next time a book would come, we'd do it a little bit differently and then a little bit differently until it became this idea that we just wanted to turn into something and we weren't sure what. And then, you know, at that time for me, when we were trying to construct the narrative, uh, and we can see the fallout of it all around us, but there was a lot of divisiveness in uh, the conversation about culture, in the conversation about race, in the culture of identity, like all of these conversations were happening where it just seemed like if there was any way at all that people could find a common language, then maybe we could move forward together towards problems that were bigger than those, those other things. And um, that was kind of started to structure the narrative. You know, we. It was fun to make, put robots and mermaids at the bottom of the ocean, but then once we had to put them sort of into a conflict, that's when we would have discussions about what does it, what are the bigger implications of this? What are we trying to say? And one of the things that we are doing in our Silent Guardian books is that the narrative is retrospective. The narrative that you're reading is the story that somebody has learned many years later and is retelling it we kind of always imagine that the person telling the story is one of the characters who is in the book and they're retelling it almost like in the oral tradition and so they're putting a a different kind of wisdom and reflection on the event so that the illustration is sort of the fun exciting exploration of what might happen next and the narrative is um something that we've added that you're hearing after the fact. And that's, you know, in the way, that's one of the magics of comics is that you can have these two things happening on the same page at the same time, constructing new meaning out of image and word. And it plays with time and all of that is going on in your head while you're reading it. Cause you might question like, oh, well that panel doesn't really seem to seem to describe what I'm seeing. And when you create that question between those two things, now that drives a third layer of the story, which uh, is something that Justin and I both feel pretty strongly that we should challenge young readers to ask questions while they're reading a book to say, hey, this didn't make sense. And if they explore it, there is a meaning to be discovered if they read it more than once. I think that's a, a really good example of like the unreli unreliable narrator, right? Where it's like you kind of, that tension between who's narrating the story and who's experiencing the story are kind of two different things. And you have to decide whether or not you believe the narrator or you believe the character. And I think that's like a very fun, personally is one of my favorite things when I'm reading something or when I'm reading a graphic novel or reading a story or anything like that. I love it when I can't quite decide what's happening. 
it's a very fascinating thing, right? Where it's like, there's a little bit of tension between reality and like fiction. I love that. I love it when it's kind of in your face a bit about that. So when you guys created this story, it was based off of another existing story. How much did it build off of Cassie and Tom entirely in its own, just in its own universe? Or did you pull from that uh, existing narrative a lot? It's uh, it's pretty distinctly different other than like the, the visual style and, and some of the um, like the, the friendship themes um, between like yeah. the, the robot and the human counterpart. There's there's not a whole lot of of shared lines connecting those two stories um, at this time. Would you say that's true, writer Gregory? Yeah, I would say so. <laughs> I, I want to also point out that, Chris, you you maybe have solved a problem for us. Because oh, really? We, yeah, we work in this really weird way where Justin and I try to figure out a way to give credit where it's due. And I usually come in later, kind of at the David Attenborough approach as the narrator, yeah. and I come in and I add to it. But I think uh, it's a term from literature that you used here. We should just start crediting me, don't you think, Justin, as the unreliable narrator? I like Absolutely. that. Absolutely. It's very fitting. You, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you should do it. I will <laughs> expect some royalties. I expect to check for suggesting this. Just kidding. But the unreliable narrator is a really interesting literate like approach to literature. And I, I love that in storytelling. I love it when I can't tell if the narrator is telling the truth or not, right? And I think with graphic novels, that's like a very, uh, it's a very different and distinct thing because in a novel you're like, is the narrator just saying this? But there's no like visual comparison. Whereas when you put an unreliable narrator on top of a very visual, tangible kind of thing, that's a different experience. I think that's very interesting. Yeah, totally. And just to speak to your original question, um, one of the things that we're trying to do with the Silent Guardians is to, to have the format suggest that the, what kind of story you can count on when you find the book. So like they'll definitely yeah. be a big robot and the big robot is definitely not the bad guy. Um, yeah. But beyond that, the rest of it is more or less a surprise. And we call it the Silent Guardians because um, up until now, none of these guardian robots uh, ever say a word. They're usually interpreted through their actions, whether they're good or bad. So would you say then that um, your books in the Silent Guardian series are thematically similar? Because you were talking about how the differences between Cassie and Tonk and Rust and Water and how there were you know, so many differences. But it sounds as though um, on, an, on an underlying level, there is a certain level of consistency or um, of reliability to what a reader is going to get in those books. That's a good point, Lyndon. That's like, there's like that connecting thread, right? Between the two stories. Yeah. Um, stories don't have to be connected by plot to be related. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a perfect statement thank you i'm glad you agree <laughs> but it is it is a good point that Lyndon made right where it's like you don't necessarily and then very similar into zach's story for example where it's like you have these kind of independent stories that sort of tie together but sort of don't and like they do and like having that thing that you that's that one thing that you put together that isn't necessarily the narrative, right? Like there are so many universes that uh, Stephen King is a perfect example, right? Where like the It universe ties into the Christine universe, ties into the Dark Tower universe, ties in, and all of these stories are so distinct and unique on their own, but they kind of have these like, these common threads that run through all of them. And I think that's a good example of that. Almost like an infinite universe. Almost. Oh my, is that, is that the motivation for your, is, is that the motivation? Is that where that comes from? Get it now from Mythos and Inc. <laughs> yeah. Get Almost it like soon. soon. On sale now, right? <laughs> okay, so do, do you have anything else to add to that before we move into the Q&A section? I was going to say that it's just really wonderful to hear uh, or to, to hear Zach talk about how he just went for it. Um, Perfect. When you read Thread, it doesn't feel like the kind of story that will just sort itself out because it ties no. it so yeah. well. 
I didn't and, know either, to be fair. Right? But that's the, <laughs> I had no idea. Justin will always say to me as we're working, we'll get kind of two thirds in and we'll have our darlings together. And he'll say, I know we've got to kill some of these darlings along the way, but we have enough to keep going. That's a phrase that he uses a fair amount when we're collaborating. He says, oh, we got enough to keep going. So we just kind of put that next panel together, that next page together. And that really is how you how you get stuff finished is, uh, especially in this day and age where there are so many things competing for your time, your attention, your emotions, that if you're trying to get some creative stuff done, you just have to let yourself work just that day. And it, that'd be enough. Yeah. yeah. And also with the phrase, kill your darlings. Well, well, as someone who writes a lot, it's true. Sometimes you do have to kill your darlings. I think that's also something that is maybe said too much where it's because often your darlings are what makes your story darling, right? Like you, you have to kill your darlings sometimes. Yes, on the odd occasion, you have to accept that it doesn't work and you have to be willing to cut things and edit and make those changes. But at the same time, if you really truly believe with something and believe in something with every fiber of your being, that's part of what makes that story really magical to people is because they can sense that, right? So I think that you, have the, to, you have to take your darlings and put them in a gladiatorial combat and the strongest one will emerge. I exactly think. like highlander you have to highlander yeah, there can only forever. be one <laughs> there can only that happened be to one. And I quite recently with something we were working on um i won't go into details but it was this thing that i had thought out and it was so cool but it ruined the end of the story and we just for like a couple hours we just couldn't make it work so we're like it's gotta go and yeah <laughs> like the you lore added, was <laughs> you added a thing to a monster and we were like how can we justify this yeah, in the, it's in so cool, but it didn't volume, work. And you can't, so we had to yeah. get rid of it. Yeah. yeah, but maybe the suggestion there is, yeah. maybe, maybe don't you kill your darlings. Maybe put them in a different pen. Like maybe if you oh, come yeah. up with a fantastic idea and you're like, this is so great and I love it so much and I don't want it to die, but it doesn't work in this story. Yeah, Take I mean, it and then save it for another story. Definitely. Keep it like in a your bolt back on pocket. Concept, That's something you right? can definitely do. It all goes yeah. somewhere. Yeah. Okay, so I think we're going to move into the Q&A section of this. And so we have our first question from Mary. And Mary is asking, I'm a writer and I can't grasp yet how you write a story together. For those who worked as a team, how do you balance the roles of a story writer and artist, especially when you're both an artist? So who think, wants to take that first? I think that's me and Lyndon, right? I'm not an artist, so. But, but we've had, uh, Lyndon and I are working on another project together and we have tried several different approaches like Steve and Lyndon have worked with that traditional method they talked about. Yeah, and we, cool. Lyndon and I tried that and we tried the marble method where I do some of the drawing, he fills the stuff in like Greg and just, we're still trying to figure out what our process is. Um, yeah, it's hard. It's tough. Yeah. Like we've had, we're working together and we've got a cool project we both believe in, but we're definitely still trying to sort out what the best process for that is. So it's, I'd say from what you've seen here, uh, Mary, it's on a case by case basis with your individual team. Mm -hmm. Each team, like Lyndon's working with, I think everybody here in some capacity and each approach <laughs> is different. Justin, uh, you wanna work on something? <laughs> so the, the trick to, I think Gregory and I success with stories is road trips. We have to go on, in the before times during conventions, we go on two or three long road trips during the year. And we would come up with the best stories and the best story beats and the best twists during those like 12, 13 hour road trips. So I think that's the key to coming up with a great story together. Go in a, go in a road trip with, with a friend for a couple hours. Yeah, there's, some, there's some legitimate advice in that though, where it's yeah. that if you're working with someone, you need to understand that individual. Whether you understand that individual by going on 13 hour road trips together, or it's that someone that you know well, or someone that you have a lot of conversations with, it seems to be that you just need to know that person pretty well, right? And Lyndon mm -hmm. has been excellent. From what I've seen with all his different creative pursuits, Lyndon is very good at that. And definitely someone you could email for more questions about harassment. You, you don't need to feed Lyndon's ego. It He's, is fine on its own. You don't, don't need to feed it. <laughs> He's got um, an entire room in his house for it. So you're too late. No. Yeah. <laughs> That's black. 
The little there plaques are. about yeah, how exactly. great of a letter he is. Okay, he's please. got awards. Forget about him. <laughs> all right, all right. Let's stop. Um, uh, no, <laughs> uh, I do. I do have some advice for working with artists. Now, I'm not, um, you know, a fine artist in the same way everyone else is. Um, but when it comes to working together as a team, I think there are a couple of really important things that you want to keep in mind. Um, kind of the most important thing you can do is communicate, which seems really obvious, but um, it's harder than you think it's going to be. It takes a, a good amount of mutual respect. It takes a lot of being able to um, push back against one another when there are things you don't agree on and recognize where the core of the things that you do agree on come from. Um, from there, when it comes to writing a story, I, there's a big difference between writing a story and writing a script. Um, writing a story is what you and your artist coming together on, you know, a tale or an adventure or, a, you know, for lack of a better word, a story that you agree on. And then as a writer, your job is to take that huge concept and fine tune it to a point that you can bring it to an artist and uh, it still retains that core of what you both loved about it. Answer. And uh, I'll, I'll plus one on Lyndon there. Honesty is, is, is paramount in a partnership. Um, and I know it sounds like marriage counseling, but uh, it's truly like honesty matters because uh, there were multiple times during infinite universe and um, really not so much now. Cause I think I learned from infinite universe um, when your writer asks you, especially if that writer is a good friend, when they ask you, how are you doing? What page are you on? They're not trying to trip you up. If you're honest and you say, dude, I didn't get any pages done this week. They're there to help you construct and, and get back on that track. Yeah. Um, so don't lie to each other. Um, I wouldn't say I ever lied to Lennon or anything like that. I just mean like, you know, you, you kind of go, well, you know, I, I looked at this page for about three hours on Tuesday. And then, uh, and then, uh, you know, I, I watched TV to, to inspire myself. It's like, no, it's just be honest. It's huge. That's definitely yeah. something I that, I think that. Is... Oh, sorry. Continue. No, it's okay. I was just going to say, I would add to that, that um, there's sort of two processes that I've found that are replicatable, regardless of where you are on your journey as a writer. And so these are the two pieces of advice I would give. Number one is what Justin was saying, is percolate together. Find the person you want to uh, work on a project with, and don't leave their side for a long stretch of time until you have the whole bones of the project. When we're doing the road trip, it's funny because, you know, we're driving 16 hours somewhere so we're sleeping one person's driving one person's sleeping and so Justin will wake up and be like I got it right and we would just do this bounce back and forth so um it doesn't leave you the freedom to escape the story you just tell yourself you're not going to leave until that's done the other thing you can do when you know you have a regular kind of life which is what most people are doing as they're trying to enter into a creative life is they have something that's much more scheduled and much more demanding is when you're working with creators both of you should have veto power and mm -hmm. you should never have to justify your veto when someone says i don't like that you should say okay and change your mind move in a different direction and it's in that way that you will begin to plot a course together that you're both really passionate about, that you're both really interested in. If someone says, hey, I really wanna do a, you know, a book where you draw a whole bunch of ships and they say, ooh, don't push that idea. They've already told you they are not interested in doing that, right? You wanna, you wanna feel from them the same joy that you have with the idea. And ideas are so worthless at the beginning, you can just generate them endlessly. So you might as well keep doing it until you find something you're both happy with. Um, a collaborator I worked on on a different uh, project, Dr. Jillian Horton, she introduced to me a really great system too that I've tried to incorporate, which I'll share uh, with you, Mary, that give your edits with your other creative partner a ranking from one to 10. So that if you get five, say, edits from the person, you get five ideas from them, and they rank them. They say, oh, this one's a two, this one's a one, this one's a 10. 
then you'll know where to put your creative energy into what to fight for. Because if yours is a 10 and they want to take it out, but they're only a one at taking it out, well, they'll leave it, right? You'll be able to know what parts of the project are worth the argument. And working on creative stuff, you know, uh, Stephen made a joke about it. It sounds like marriage counseling, uh, but it's pretty passionate exchange to defend an idea. And so, and you're going to work closely with this person. You're going to text them in the middle of the night. You're going to meet them at all hours for coffee at restaurants. It's almost like having an affair on your regular life. So you better figure out how to make that work in a way that doesn't blow up both your regular life, right? Because now you're dealing with uh, a, a miscommunication problem or your creative life. You have to balance those things. And, and those three strategies I find are pretty useful. Yeah, find a way to make your affair work. No, that <laughs> okay. I know that came across. Oh my I, I think it, it touches on something that is, um, I, I th from my perspective, and I think from most creatives perspectives, very close to our hearts, and that there has to be some vulner vulnerability in that process, right? Where you have to be a little bit vulnerable you have to be willing to share personal ideas with someone. You have to be to take criticism on personal ideas, right? Like there is this vulnerability that comes through creation, specifically in group creation, where you're joining another person and you're coming up with these ideas that are personal to you or personal to them, and you're giving feedback on it. Like I marriage counseling I think is actually kind of the perfect example right where it is a relationship and you have to be willing to talk with each other and have those sometimes tough conversations and be willing to say I'm not sure if I agree with you on that or that's a fantastic idea I support it 100 percent right and I and I think that vulnerability and that openness is very important any in any kind of creative relationship um, so we have, an, we have a, quite a few questions coming up. So our next question is, what was your single biggest influence for each of you? So whoever wants to go first, what was your single biggest influence? Do I need to call names? Do I need to be like a teacher? <laughs> Maybe, yeah. Do it. Okay, look in. Who was your single biggest influence? I feel like I know the answer. <laughs> um... Greg Kamichuk. <laughs> Greg Kamichuk. No. Uh, <laughs> no, um, so it's a, it's, a, uh, it's a tough question to ask. See, now you know how I felt 15 minutes ago, Gregory. Um, uh, I think influence comes from a number of different sources. So there are the creators that you aspire to emulate. Um, that aren't people that are in your close circle. Um, and then there are those that you know that you watch and say um, that, that you recognize the things that they're doing and that you aspire to do those things. So on certain levels, I, I mean, I look at, yes, no, I look at Gregory and I look at Justin and the fact that they are people that I know that are that I can speak to that are making a living doing something they love in a world where it seems so increasingly difficult to do that, um, those are influences. Those are positive influences that have on my life, that, that, uh, that I have in my life. Um, if we're talking more generally, like there, when I started reading comics, there were certain comic creators that made me fall in love with reading comics. And, you know, that's, I don't know them in person. It's a different kind of influence. Um, but they are in their own way equally influential. And so um, I think it really comes down to um, recognizing that you're going to draw your drive from multiple sources in your life. And the culmination of those drives are sort of unique to who you are. That was a fantastic and very philosophical answer, Lyndon. We're going to move on to Stephen. Stephen, who are your, who's the single most greatest influence in your art? Well, probably Lyndon, because as he and I worked together on that speech he just gave, <laughs> um, we know. You guys need to stop referencing each other. This is becoming a very like 
involved kind of incestuous okay i'll i'll sim i'll i'll simplify uh i, I honestly <laughs> did what everything everything Lyndon said like well, i i get asked this question a lot um and like i'll i'll dodge from todd mcfarland for the the business at acumen yeah. that he that he puts towards comics uh, Jack Kirby for his page rate, for God's sakes. Like, oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, uh, there's these two legendary artists from Winnipeg that I just, it's great. Um, <laughs> no, no, but like, I know I'll say Greg and Justin right there because uh, no, I, I'll tie it back. I'm going to bring it back full circle. Uh, when I said go to conventions <laughs> and go to conventions like early in your yeah. life, uh, early in your career. And like, yes, it's one thing to attend, but I think um, getting the table, uh, I, I meant that when I said it, 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 I think it to a lot of the creators that are out there, it turns you from the person asking questions on the other side of the table, which is very valuable to someone who's actually put their skin in the game and they're right there. And now they're part of the community. Cause like, yeah, no, just going to conventions, these guys just, shaking your hand and saying welcome to the show is just awesome um are you my follow-up question is are you calling justin gregory old are we about to, <laughs> no no i'm just kidding <laughs> it is it really is influential yeah. to have people within your own community especially winnipeg which is like the biggest small town in the world everyone knows everyone it is really influential and meaningful to have people from your own community and from your own town kind of uh contributing to that uh we're gonna follow up with zach though who i don't think is a native winnipegger who no, might I, have a different answer i've been to the show you're before, calgary I, right love your show i am calgary um but i did love the winnipeg yeah. show when i made it out there you've got some really cool local comic stuff going on um i'm definitely jealous not that you live in winnipeg but that you have a great con scene um <laughs> That's my, a fair uh, answer. I, I loved Lyndon's answer. Not we have me two rivers, okay? Hi, <laughs> two Zach complimenting me. We just have the one, so fair enough. Um, but uh, no, outside of what Lyndon said, which was a very great answer, I feel the same way. If I had to just pick, like my answer when people ask, like, what's your favorite comic? What's your favorite what, biggest inspiration? And I think the last couple of years since I read it is It's Bone by Jeff Smith. I've got lots of personal contacts in this scene and stuff too, but as far as comics go, he just, he tapped into something that appeals to literally everybody. And the more I think about it, that's the kind of stuff I'm looking to make. And I really, I love what he's doing. It's just a story that literally everybody likes. Like not all ages, like the parents sit there rolling their eyes. Like, no, the parents, if they read it, would love it. It's just good storytelling for everybody. And that accessibility and then good cartooning, just really good cartooning. So if I had to pick a person I don't know, it would definitely be Jeff Smith. Um, but I could if you also had to pick a person you did know though, since we're already on this oh, tangent. This, you could pick a person you did know. What they were saying about meeting people at cons, uh, there's a guy that all of us here know, Peter Tchaikovsky, um, was just, I've been behind his booth for years. We've been buddies. We play shows together. Whenever he's in town, we're old friends. But he was the guy who really helped me learn how to network and shake hands and got me kind of behind the scenes. When I was just going, hey, I, can, I think I might want to go to art. That was before I went to college or anything. He was just this, he knows everybody. He's just this great force of And his community. heart is this big. Oh, yeah. He's, crazy. he's the man. So Peter Tchaikovsky. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, Justin, who would be your greatest influence if you had to pick one person? Um, I'm, I'm not going to pick a person. I'm going to pick Lego as my no. biggest, most That's a good yeah. answer. like core inspiration. And like how I became the person I am today is a childhood filled with building space Lego, building sets, building robots, yeah. and, you know, making up my own scenarios and movies with, with this Lego, like, um, and then even my, my artwork and how my, like, technically how it works, I often compare it to Lego. I'll build these cool pieces and then use them over and over and over again. Um, so yeah, I, when I think about what inspires me most, like, there's a lot of movies, there's a lot of shows, there's a lot of comics, but if yeah. it's just one thing, the one big thing would be playing with a lot of Lego for a lot of hours. That's yeah, awesome. Sure. And that's such a like, uh, again, with like, I think the tie between <laughs> Lego and graphic novels, it, it is a visual thing. It is the, this very tangible thing that you're working mm -hmm. with, right? Where if you were 
Yeah, I, I, cool, I love it. What's your favorite Lego set? I have to ask now. Well, I, I would build it like like the one time I'd, I'd follow the booklet and then two seconds later, I'd destroy it for the cool pieces <laughs> to build my own thing. So I very rarely kept it as what it was intended to be for very long. It would very quickly just be merged with everything else so I could make a much bigger spaceship than I could make before. It, so it was always spaceships, hey? It was, it was always space. It was always sci-fi. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like I have some Lego right here. And I have a little Lego spaceship, little Y wing right here. But that's very cool, and I think that's like a really interesting um, perspective on like um, I don't motivation and inspiration and that kind of stuff, right? Where it's like there are so many things that can be transferred from one medium to another. So like from Lego to making graphic novels, that's awesome. I think that's a really cool inspiration. Thank you, Dustin. Um, Gregory, what's the, if you had to pick one inspiration for your artistic career, your vast artistic career, what would it be? Um, I think Gregory Kamicha. Like very well, I was listening <laughs> to everybody's, everybody's uh, great answers, uh, except for the ones where they pointed at us. Um, <laughs> the, so I think in the interest of full disclosure, it's important that I point out that uh, I'm from the ancient times and I started kind of late in um, sort of professionally pursuing creative expression. And the moment for me, the watershed moment was sitting uh, uh, outside with a friend of mine, Anthony Allen, and he was an industrial designer at the time. And I can remember saying to him, I want to make comics, but I don't really know how. And he said, well, you know how to draw. And I was like, yeah, but there's so many more parts to it than just that. And he looked me right in the eye and he's like, well, you know, in industrial design, we have a motto and that's sell your strengths and buy your weaknesses. He says, do everything you know how to do and then find people who know how to do the other things and pay them. And that really did light a fire under me because I've, you know, I also think that we should all do things according to our gifts. And, you know, I had always written and I'd always drawn stories, but I just didn't quite have the skills to put it all together. And so um, often when I think about the beginning of my creative career, it was sitting with someone that you would not initially think of as being a, a lever of inspiration, you know, sitting with an industrial designer saying, oh, well, that's just a part that needs to be fixed. And here's what you have to do to do it. So I think about that uh, fairly often. And then my continuing motivation is that, uh, uh, you know, we joke about this in our podcast uh, all the time that life is short, um, you'll be dead soon, and there's no afterlife. So you should try to fill up the present <laughs> with what it is that you want to be working on, because that's really how you'll be remembered afterwards. Now plug your podcast. Super. <laughs> yeah, plug your podcast real quick. Let's hear it. Super Pulp Science, where we talk about how genre gets made. That's awesome. I think that's also like a really valid thing where it's like, I, I don't write graphic novels for a living, but I remember having a conversation with my high school English teacher where I said, I want to be a writer, but like there are no jobs in that. And he looked at me like I was the single stupidest person on planet earth. And he was like, what are you, what are you saying? Of course you could be a writer for a living. Like maybe you're not writing novels, but you could write for a living kind of thing. And it was this really unexpected motivational moment for me. So I, hearing about like an industrial engineer or a like, that that's really cool like that's an awesome inspiration i'm really glad you guys had that um so another question is how to uh, oh oops, sorry let me just pull up my thing here um someone asked um what's how when you work together with another artist how do you incorporate both of your unique artistic styles mm -hmm. ours is a quick one yeah please we don't yeah we don't yeah <laughs> yeah that's fair that's also fair yeah, we were really hard to keep it like separate. a vision or yeah we we have very distinctly different styles that appeal to uh different crowds and there's a little bit of overlap but it's it's worked out so great traveling together and doing conventions together being side by side we're appealing to different parts of the crowd and so i think that saved us from feeling too competitive with each other or feel like we're stealing each other's sales the fact that we have this yeah. super distinct artistic style and then when we work on books together it's it's kind of a its own its own thing but 
I, uh, I like having very distinctly different styles and, and keeping those apart. We tried working together once with me coloring your work. And yeah, we did it that one time. That's true. one time. That's the story right there. Yeah. Yeah, that's the story. Yeah, do more of what's working, I think, is a, is a yeah. good. Uh, good yeah. Well, Gregory, do we, can we, is our thing official? Yeah. We could, because we're, Gregory and I are tentatively starting a small project. Sure, yeah, it's official. Yeah, All I'm, you I'm, guys just working together, hey? Every time I think that there isn't a connection, there's a connection somewhere there. Anyways, he's, continue. He's laying down some great design work and I'm telling the story in that world he's kind of set up that we've all been making up stories in. And he's, his designs are, I'm using them to make, like we needed a character in the scene. I'm like, hey, show me some of your designs you've made for this other thing. I wanna see what I'm ripping off of here. So it, it's in the end, this story that I'm telling, well, that he's telling we're working together on is gonna use his designs, my style, our storytelling kind of meeting in the middle. So we're just kind of finding the parts that work and then I'm gonna end up drawing the final story, but it's it's all his world and stuff. And it's great working with somebody else who can draw because it's nice to have like, here's what I have in mind. And it's not like this sentence or something. It's like, here's literally, here's the thing yeah. I have in mind. What can you do with that? And then I change, there's room for a give and take and it's it's a refreshing kind of part of the process. Yeah, sometimes yeah. it can be difficult, I imagine, yeah. when you're dealing with someone who's more verbal versus visual, when you have two visual artists together. I mean, not to stoke Lyndon's ego, but Lyndon's fantastic at that. But it is also nice to uh, just change it up and try different stuff. And it's nice to have kind of, a, I guess, concept yeah. artist. Is that too? That, that's kind of what it is. He's got the concept art, and I'm making the comic book from that. It's yeah. also yeah. a cool process. Yeah. I'd like to guess, like, I haven't worked directly with another artist in a collaboration yet, like another visual artist. Um, but I would think, you, you, yeah, you probably gotta lay down your, and this could provoke discussion, I don't know, but uh, you probably gotta lay down your ground rules first though too. Um, if you're both, fight, like if, if right in the beginning, you're both like, oh, I'm so excited to draw this, oh, I'm so excited to draw that, maybe figure out a way to make that work um, before just diving into it because if you're fighting for pages or something like that, like, uh, like the way, the, the way Lennon and I work, he, he's a writer and I'm, I'm an artist. He's a, a hell of a good letterer. And obviously we fit together like two proper puzzle pieces there, but, uh, um, award-winning writer, uh, Lennon Rachenka MD. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I Dr. Lyndon Rachenka. Yeah. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> <That's> Esquire. <laughs> Lawyer for Lyndon Dr. Rachenka Esquire the third. Yes. Please Take let's it. just continue <laughs> on with the question. Yeah. He's actually a Red Seal carpenter as well. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like I said, I'm guessing there, but uh, I feel like personally, if I was working with someone, like I'd probably have that discussion early. Um, cause if we're both contributing work, awesome. But if, if one is the writer and, and one is the artist, um, I think as long as you understand your roles, not like a know your role kind of thing, but as long as you understand the role you're taking in the book, um, I'm sure a lot of good stuff will come out of having two artists, um, kind of looking yeah. at the pages. Yeah. It's just a conversation that you have to have beforehand, right? Like much I'm like guessing. we yeah. talked before about any kind of partnership, you have to have that conversation. Okay. So we have one more question. Before we wrap up, and that is, how do you decide between self-publishing and traditional publishing? Do the traditional one first, and when you get enough rejections, publish it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm the other way around. I published it, self-published it, and then Mythos was like, "Hey, can we publish that?" I'm like, "Also, yes." So I did both. Yeah, I, I should clarify. We didn't do that. We 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 <laughs> we self-published first, our first round there. Uh, that was a little joke, but uh, yeah. I mean, self-publish, if you want to make it, do it. I mean, something that we learned early on when we were starting our book is, especially in the publishing industry, um, you can prove to any potential publisher um, or anyone else that you can finish a project by self-publishing it. And yeah. finishing a project is the most important thing that you can do when you're starting out in this industry. Yeah. yeah. So if Even if self-publishing is just putting it online for free, like yep. that's still self-publishing. Like we went to like a, a different route. And I think if we had shopped around a little more or if the internet was just a little further ahead, we may not have 
maybe spend so much money. Um, but I think, uh, I think it worked for us, but like, I know Zach, but he did the Kickstarter, the Webtoons. I love that idea. Like what a good way to do it. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't do Webtoons again, to be fair, but the Kickstarter oh, was but awesome. The Kickstarter. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'll mention that when I first started out, um, I had sent the Imagination Manifesto to, you know, probably I got 40 or 50 rejections, but about 20 of those rejections said the same thing. We really like it, but it's not quite for us. It doesn't fit the brand of our publisher. It's a little too different than the things we published. And once I had a lot of that feedback from people who I felt were giving honest criticism to say like, it is good enough to publish and we would publish it if it was a little more in keeping with the kind of books that we did. Uh, that's when I realized that they had sort of triangulated the answer, which is that first book you're going to have to do yourself. And comics is very open to the idea of self-publishing. A regular sort of prose book land, it, there's a little bit more of a stigma. But in comics, how you get into comics is you make it yourself and you prove you can finish yeah. for sure. Um, but you also have to know, if you don't want to be deceived, you have to know what you're hungry for. And so if someone is trying to choose between those two things, they have to say to themselves, am I hoping to get a living wage out of publishing a book? If you are, traditional publishing is extremely difficult to get a living wage out of a regular, traditional, top tier publisher. It's very narrow and the, the market is very difficult. But if you control your means of production as a self-publisher, you get all the steps in the middle that's paying you instead of a whole bunch of other people you can earn a living wage self-publishing books in a way that you can't when you are publishing with larger publishers so i always uh advocate for a hybrid model have lots of work put some of it uh with traditional publishers so that people know who you are and it gets into regular distribution and own as much of your own work as you possibly can yeah, I'll um, just to, to add on to that. I mean, all of us here are proof that you can do both with the same book if you want to. Um, but the exciting thing about comics, especially now, is that there has never been an easier way to make a comic and put it out in the world and have people be able to see it. Um, it is such an exciting time to be making things, uh, especially if you don't feel like you want to go the traditional publishing route because as Gregory said, there are ways that you can make those things and you can keep it and you can allow it to stay yours. Um, and then if someday you decide you wanted to go down the traditional publishing route, you still can do that. Um, and at that so point, they're probably coming to you, right? Once you have a couple of your own things, then they, they're giving you the lucrative offer as opposed well, to you kind of fishing for a, a gig. Maybe. Hopefully. Is that how it works? You get two things and then they just start paying you? You make a couple things and they give you the shoulder tap. I've seen it happen. <laughs> oh, whoa. okay. Um, well, there's there's no distinct equation, uh, no. but proving that you can create work that is marketable is obviously yeah. helpful yeah. Um, in a lot of ways. And I made a cheeky joke earlier about liking fan fiction, but there's a genuine reason why I like it. And I think it's because it gets people creating. And I think that's so much um, a thing about self-publishing as well is that if you are there constantly making stories and writing things and publishing it on your own and like getting into that process, that's, that's a very helpful thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like just getting into that mindset of I'm starting a, starting a thing, I'm doing the thing from start to finish, I'm doing it. Like that's already more than like 90% of people out there who want to create something, right? So our time is up for our Q&A. Um, thank you guys so much for participating. I really appreciate it. Um, and I know that we had a few questions and that this conversation has been fantastic. And I think it's been really helpful for a lot of people. Um, I'm going to pass it back to Kyle if he's on the line. And Kyle yeah. has a few things to, uh, a few stuff to wrap things up. Well, I, oh man, that was so good. I appreciate from from all of our creators to come and it's weird because like we put on the event and yet I feel like I learned so much Yeah, <laughs> just, just by watching. So I'm sitting here all enthralled while you guys are doing some amazing work. 
Uh, before I announce the winner of our contest, I do want to have a few closing announcements. First off, remember these three graphic novels, uh, Infinite Universe, Thread, and Western Water, are eventually going to be available. Uh, we do have one available, one on pre-order, and one that is going to be available. All the links in the description are down below. If you want to be reminded of when these graphic novels are coming out or when new stuff is coming out, stuff that we're working on, be sure to sign up for a newsletter at mythosync.com slash sign up. The motto of Mythos and Inc. is to publish stories for Geeks by Geeks. That's our goal. That's our dream. That's our hope. We're also committed to helping you along the way to get published. Hence events like tonight. We even have a world building podcast, for instance, that is just finishing up Shadow and Bone, I believe. That's where we're at. Yeah. Christiana, just what was the best part of Shadow and Bone for you? Quick, quick. Oh, don't spoil it. Oh, oh, okay, uh, okay, okay, okay. We can't let I love the novel series. I think the show did a fantastic job of creating a universe. Uh, Normally, I like it when things make things different in adaptations, but they actually kept it pretty close to the books and they did a phenomenal job. I can can sing more praises for the show. It was great. So after you watch the show, go check out our podcast because we really analyze the the different aspects of the world and and how the nuance of that between the books and the movie or the show and and so much more. So it's it's awesome. We really love it. Also, we have an active Discord writing community that you're welcome to join. Uh, You can check out the community section on our website at mythosinc.com. And finally, it is time for our winner. I want to say a big congratulations to... Mary, Mary V. Mary, uh, you are today's winner, so that means we'll be getting you all three of those books. Uh, We're going to have Emma contact you and kind of get that ball rolling to get some address information and stuff like that. But thank you all so much for coming out. For those that did ask questions and they didn't get answered, don't worry. We've kind of kept a log of them, and then we're going to feed them to these creators, and then we'll post a blog a little bit later and get them to answer these questions just for us. So that way, all questions that can get answered. Thank you, everyone, for coming. It has been a wonderful time. I'll talk to you next time when we have more comic creators.